But this week we're going to tackle something known as knowledge. Everybody say knowledge. knowledge. And we're going to try to help all of us understand when the Bible says um, we're to add knowledge to our faith. What is it actually talking about? What does that look like? So you really have to put the two words together, truth and knowledge. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to read our series verse, um, verses 3 through 8, where the writer says, hey, it's super important that when you come to faith in Christ that you add these things to your faith. So it starts out by saying, His divine power has given us everything we need for godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Verse 5, For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, also known as brotherly love, and to mutual affection, love. There's that word I talked about, unconditional love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Week five, when we go over self-control and nobility and all those things, we're also going to talk about and give you the reason why it takes the progression it does. And it says, if you you add, um, we need you to add to your faith goodness and then to goodness knowledge. So it's not just that you add these things individually to your faith, it's that you add this one and then on top of this one, you put this one. And then to knowledge self-control and then to self-control you got to add perseverance and so you if you just kind of allow the word to wash over you can at least right there you can understand why it's important that it's laid out the way it's laid out so it says um self-control what you need to add to self-control is perseverance look at your neighbor and say don't give up so we'll talk about that but i want you to see that scriptures um it's really smart to, to pay attention to the flow of Scripture as much as it is to what it's saying. So if you're like new to Bible study and you're just jumping off into small groups and you're starting to read the Bible, um, I, I want to kind of pause and encourage you to always know who's writing it, know the time that they're writing in, the context of the whole thing, um, and pay attention to what it says, but also pay attention to the flow of what it says. How many of you ever jumped into the middle of a conversation and really didn't understand what they were talking about? Like you just came into the conversation and you heard some word and you're like, what are you talking about? And they're like, oh, well, let me back up 30 minutes and tell you where we've come in this conversation. And a lot of times in Bible study, especially in American Christianity, we jump into the middle of a verse or we get what is known as the verse of the day. Who gets the verse of the day on your phone? It just pops up. This is the verse of the day. I think that's great. I think you should continue to do that. But know this, um, just because you get like a verse, which is like, for, you know, the chapter one, verse three, um, you really need to back off of that at some point in the day or the week and try to figure out what is it really saying inside that letter it came from. Because inside the New Testament, you have a lot of epistles. I must say epistle. Which is a letter going to a church to address problems, deal with issues, to encourage them. So like if, if I wrote you a letter and I only sent you one line out of that letter, would you understand what I'm talking about? Or you might think I'm a crazy person. Because right, it could be anything out of there. So when you're reading the Bible, I want to encourage you to do that. So at the end of the series, while we're going over these individually, I'm going to do the best that I can to wrap up and tell you why he builds it the way that he does. But this week it says, hey, to your goodness. So goodness um, in the original language just means this, moral excellence. Who feels like they're morally excellent? No, but awesome. Well, good news. The Bible says add that to your faith. Okay, so, but I, but I want to talk to you about kind of how that happens. And so you have, it says add to your faith goodness, which means moral excellence. And then it says to that, add knowledge. Everybody say knowledge. knowledge. But it's a specific kind of knowledge. And older people understand this knowledge. So in the Greek, it literally means experientially known, um, functional knowledge that you gain from firsthand experience. You know how to apply that knowledge to situations in your life um, by having a direct relationship with an event that taught you that that's actually true. So how many older people in here know exactly what I'm saying? You could say this, there's like six of y'all, and the rest of you looked at me like, I don't really know what you're saying. Um, How many know what wisdom is? 
How many know what wisdom is? Okay, um, so the Bible says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Um, the, the word fear really could be translated to respect, which just means you respect him as the author and finisher of the faith. He's the creator. He knows all things. He's way smarter than me. So the beginning of wisdom is to know this. You don't know anything. How many of you know that's like super kind of wise? Have you ever been in a position where you're like, I don't know how to handle this? Anybody? How many position right now? I don't know how to handle this. Okay, so if I were to encourage you, I would say, hey, go to, go to God and see what his perspective is on it. And so this is what this is talking about. It's, it's where you've done enough life and say, I have put my faith in Jesus and I'm working on moral excellence. I'm trying to follow it. But the way that I do that is I get some knowledge. Well, what is the knowledge that I want? I want functional knowledge. Like I don't want to come. I, honestly, I love services where, um, and, I, and I go to some where the, have you ever been to a place where the preacher gets real fired up and you get juiced up, but you're not really sure what he said? Have you ever been to there? Like, the, the worship's amazing. He gets super sweaty. He's running around, and, and you leave like you could kick the devil in the teeth, but you're not really sure what he said. It's like, I don't, that was fun. But, like, you go away and go, but I don't, what do I do now? Like, I don't, and so the Bible is, like, super, super um, pointed in giving us a way to live. Like, this is, this is just what you need to do. And, and, and that's... Um, that's sticky inside Christianity because sometimes it can sound like, hey, if you, if you want God to love you, do all these things. And it's not that. It's that now that I'm in a relationship with, because he says, add to your faith. I've already crossed the line of embracing Jesus as my forgiven leader. Now, add to your faith, like living right, getting some knowledge to help you do that. So that's goodness and knowledge. And like be self-controlled, be persevere, perseverance in that, and just keep going. Don't ever give up. Continue to push it forward. And so there is this crossover that when I decide I'm going to live for Jesus, there's these things that I kind of got to add to my faith. But this is, this is the kind of knowledge that I know how to apply it at the right time, at the right place in my life, so right stuff happens. That's what he's talking about. In our world, <clears throat> we're taught to gain knowledge all the time because there's a phrase, knowledge is, it's a may, everybody knew that. I didn't have to give it to you because it's just ingrained in us. Gain as much knowledge as you can, as often as you can. Read as many books, go to as many classes, because at the end of the day, knowledge is power. There are 7,000 universities in our country. 7,000. You can pick anyone to go to. There's um, 129 million books that have been published. So if you like, feel like, you've, you, like, hey, I'm up on the reading game, well, there's 129 million out there. How many of you got so far? So there's, what I'm saying is there's a lot of knowledge. And then, how, how, how many are you excited when Google came out? But who can remember it coming out? Anybody in here? There's a few people. How many of you don't know life without Google? All y'all in the front row, raise your hand. Y'all young, y'all young, y'all don't know. It's like, y'all, y'all don't even ask nobody nothing. Y'all just go, Siri, can I help you? Yeah, could you tell me how to make, like it just, and it comes up, which I think is amazing. But let me ask you this. How do you know if it's true? I mean, have you ever just thought, I, like, I'm literally talking to all the young people, because the older people had something called a book. Y'all remember those? Like, it had pages, and you, like, turned them, and if you really wanted to know something, that book didn't tell you, you had to go check out another book, or buy another book, or find somebody who had the book. Like, you just couldn't go, Siri, yes. Like, it was like, you had to work for it. Okay, so I'm talking to all the young people. Let me ask you a question. If you, if you say, Google, my head hurts, and my body aches, and I feel kind of nauseous. Can you tell me what's wrong? Well, the first diagnosis that comes up, how do you know that's like for real? When did Google get their doctor's license? Let me help y'all. Don't ever, don't ever ask Google what you got. Because I'll just tell you, I have to tell Benet this all the time, do not ask Google because I got a headache. It'll tell you I got a brain tumor. Like I'm just telling you. It's, it's always the worst. Have you ever done this? Has anybody ever said, I think I got the flu. You give them the symptoms and like you got two weeks to live. It's like it's the craziest, it's the worst thing. And, and so we, like, think about this. As a, as a society, and I'm not, this is worldwide, like we trust that Google is right. How many of y'all look on Wikipedia? How many of y'all just go on there and go, well, I just need to, I need to get some information. And look, you do it for scripture. You're like, I need to know what Moses is all about. Look, I don't know if you know this or not, but anybody, look at me, anybody within reason can edit Wikipedia. Like, y'all know that, right? I don't know if y'all know. I didn't know this till like 10, 10 years ago, five years ago, but like, I can go in there and edit Wikipedia. 
I, you know what I thought about doing? Just doing that. And just jacking with some people. Just making some weird stuff in there. But So what don't you understand is when we talk about knowledge, knowledge in and of itself is not the most important thing. So there's a, a story. I heard the story was true. I don't know if the story is true, so don't quote me that's true, but I did hear it was true. So a long time ago, um, they, they built this massive ship, and it was uh, one of the first times that they were beginning to put engines in ships. So they weren't, weren't banking on the wind anymore. We've come far in technology, so we're putting the engines in ships. And they were getting ready to like launch this massive ship, but the engine wouldn't stay cranked. And they were having all these problems, and the owners were asking all these engineers and all these people, and somebody said, hey, man, I know this guy who's been working on ships for a long time. He's kind of older. And they were concerned because they were like, yeah, well, he used to work on ships that sailed. This is like an engine ship. And they're like, I'm just telling you, man, he's kind of he's ship fancy. So you should probably give him a call. So they call him. Sure enough, older guy walks in. He's got like a medium-sized bag of tools. Let me just tell you, if an old guy shows up at your house with a medium-sized bag of tools, let him do what he do. Because he is not toting unnecessary crap. Okay? So he just, he just knows. All right? So he walks in, and, and the two owners of the ship are watching him, and he's in the engine room, and he's like looking, running around, <laughs> reaches over in his, in his bag, and walks up kind of like behind the engine and taps on something a couple times. Engine cranks right up. He goes, I'll see y'all, and then leaves. Well, like a week later, he, they get a bill. It's for 10 grand. And they're like, what the? You didn't do nothing. You walked in, tapped something with a hammer. You got, okay, we need to know what you do. So they asked him, they said, well, send us an itemized bill. And the bill read, tapping with a hammer, $2. Knowing specifically where to tap, $9,998. <laughs> so when you, here's what you begin to realize. It's, it's not about quantity of knowledge. It's about quality of knowledge. It's about understanding how to specifically apply something that's going to solve your problems. And that is priceless. And so you, everybody in here has some sort of problem. And so what you want to go to is not knowledge in, in the general, but you really want to go to the truth. Everybody say the truth. You want to have as much knowledge of the truth, everybody say the truth, as you possibly can. So John 14, 6 Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So knowledge, while I think it is great, and the Bible does say that my people perish for a lack of knowledge, it's not talking about Google. It's not talking about a ton of books. It's talking about the knowledge that actually makes a difference. And this kind of gets overrun in our lives because Jesus becomes a Sunday school answer, and we go, yeah, I know he's the truth, but I need some help over here. And what you fail to realize is Jesus said he's like the word in flesh. Like, the Bible is the truth, truth, and I'm just telling you, the Bible in some ways absolutely deals with every problem you'll ever encounter. It may not tell you exactly how to do this or exactly how to do that, but if you take the teaching in its entirety from the beginning to the end and you look at what it's trying to say and what it is saying, then you can kind of pull those things down and begin to make wise decisions. Look at everybody say, start making wise decisions. So 2 Peter, going back up, says, for this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, um, to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control, and it goes on. But I want you to see that our line really puts a relationship between faith, goodness, and knowledge, specifically knowledge of the truth or knowledge of God or knowledge of Jesus Christ. Faith always comes first. And, and I tell people this, and I'm usually pretty honest about this. If, if you don't believe in Jesus and you're coming here or you're out there and you don't plan to come here, but you just take the word and you begin to apply it, I'm talking about the word of God. Let me just tell you this, it will work. And here's why. God's faithful to himself. He's faithful to his word. He said this, my word will never go out and not do what it's designed to do. But we're going to get to why that's not enough. I know that may sound weird in the church, but I'm, I'm going to get to why that's not enough. So if you're, if you're here and you're like on the spiritual journey and you're not really sure about Jesus, I will tell you he's absolutely the truth. He's absolutely the way. He's the only way you're ever going to experience life and be fulfilled and, and have a relationship with God and, and be in this space that's really unbelievable. But look, if you just take the principles that Jesus taught, that the Bible teaches, and you apply them to your life, your life will be better. 
Let me prove it to you. Let's just, let's just say we're, we're in here and it's not about Jesus. And, but I'm using the Bible and I'm teaching you, hey, do marriage this way. So you just think about what the Bible teaches about marriage. Would your marriage be better if you just applied that information? If you, if you loved your wife in a very sacrificial and uplifting way, if you like honored your husband and listened to what he said and y'all came into agreement and you kind of just moved in that direction, would it improve your marriage? Yes. Okay, if we did what the Bible said about money, and I'm not talking about tithing, I'm just saying if it said, hey, don't ever, ever um, borrow a lot of money because if you do, you're going to be a slave to the lender. And we just talked about being debt free. How many know your money issues would like kind of be over? And it says, hey, if you don't work, you don't eat. How many know if you don't get a paycheck, it's really hard to keep a light bill on and buy groceries? So, like, it's, it's super, super practical. Hey, kids, you're in here. It says, like, hey, show your mom and dad honor and listen to them and do what they say. How many people in here who are kids currently, if you just did what your mom and dad said, how, how less grounded would you be? <laughs> right? So what I'm saying is, is, like, the principles, the truth of the word, the knowledge of the word will absolutely work, which is why Second Peter starts not with knowledge, not with goodness, not with self-control. It starts with faith. Your first step is not self-improvement. Your first step is godly transformation. It's coming to a place where you know you're broken, you're busted up, and what you need is not a lecture, not a a life plan, not some goals. You need to be transformed because in and of yourself, all by yourself, everything you touch breaks. And that's true. Because there's something wrong on the inside of it. So it starts out in Second Peter, hey, he's, he's, he's taking the stance, understanding you've already realized that, you've already made the decision to give your life to Jesus. And then he says, now that you have the foundation correct, it's on the rock of Jesus, now build off of that and put goodness and put self-control and put knowledge and put all things on that foundation because here's the truth. The reason self-help programs and lectures like that that are far away from Jesus, the reason there's so many and the reason that people will pay a lot of money to go to them and go to like a butt ton of them in a year is because they figure out, I keep applying this stuff but my life keeps breaking. I keep applying these principles and my life keeps breaking. I keep doing this and things keep going south. Why is that? Because the foundation they're putting it on is broken. I don't care how high or how strong you build the walls and the roof and all of that stuff. If your foundation in your home is jacked, it's going to crumble. And you can keep building walls on that same foundation and it's going to keep crumbling. So 2 Peter starts out by saying, add to your faith. Add to your foundation on Jesus. So if you're in here and you haven't done that, I owe you to tell you the truth. If you take these principles and you apply them, they will work for a time. But at some point, that too will crumble. Because until you decide that you need a savior and you start to build your house your, and set your foundation on him, everything else is useless. That's why Jesus says, don't build it on sand, build it on a rock. Do, do, the, do the right thing and build it from the foundation of Jesus. So that's why he says it comes first. And so for everybody in here who's placed their, their faith in Jesus, this is why this is why I pretty much harp on personal Bible study time. Look at your neighbor and say, read the Bible. So I appreciate if you're new and you're getting the daily verse, I think that's dope, don't stop doing that. If you're kind of in a devotional and it's guiding you through, don't stop doing that, that's awesome. Um, there are some beginning stages to understanding, but just know this, there's nothing, nothing, nothing better than having your own personal Bible reading slash study time. There's nothing, there's nothing that can replace that. Some people tell me all the time, well, you know, I have, I play like 15 minutes of worship songs and that's my Bible study time. No, that's your personal worship time. That's your clapping time. That's your dancing time, but it's not the same as Bible study time. It's not the same as soaking yourself in the word. Word. It's super important that you do that. Second Timothy says this. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. So that's sometimes and a lot of times taught in like ordination services and different places to instruct the person who's going to be teaching the word. Hey, you need to understand your responsibility and be able to rightly divide or rightly teach the word of truth. 
Here's what I would tell you. That verse is actually applicable to every person who's embraced Jesus as their forgiver and leader. And let me tell you why. You need to be able to rightly discern and divide the truth for you. And I would say this, for you first before you tell somebody. Like learn how to apply it to your own life. Don't ever ask or tell somebody to do something A, A you're not doing or B, you're not even trying to do. Because now what you're doing is you're giving them advice on something you don't understand. Like I could tell you how to fix an engine, but I've only done it a couple times. You don't want to take advice from me. If I've only, if I've only worked on an engine a couple times, and I'm talking about lightly, lightly worked on an engine. What do you mean? Like, I cleaned out a few carburetors, changed some spark plugs, I can change the oil, sometimes the transmission fluid, it's just a little shaky. Like, I have some experience. But if you have a serious engine problem, do you want to come to me for your engine problem? I hope not. I'm not coming to me. I'm going to Jody Iverson. You know why? Because Jody Iverson is a stinking expert. Dude, take an engine, put it back together, have parts left over, and it still runs. Because he knows what's necessary. It's not necessary. They put that in there. They didn't even need that. They throw it to the side. Like, and then it just still runs. He's worked on my cars, took stuff out of it, said, you don't really need that. And it works just fine. I don't even know. You know what else? I don't care. I'm just taking Jody's advice, and I'm living with it. My car's running. It's all good. Why? Because he's an expert. He knows. He doesn't just know how. He knows why it works. So here's my question to you. In your current state, as long as you've been walking with Jesus, do you both know how and why the word works? Because if you don't, I would, just, I would just like to tell you you're behind the ball. You need to know both know how and why. And that's the place where, honestly, you can begin to start giving people advice. Like, it took us a, it took and I a long time to be comfortable with doing marriage coaching and marriage um, seminars and all those things that we do. Because we were on the journey, we knew how to do it. But we didn't necessarily know why it worked. We just knew it worked. And I think that's okay in like the first stages. But if you really want to be a really good teacher, you can't just know how. you got to know why. And, and we've been married long enough that we are beginning to know like all facets of marriage as to why it works. And we kind of got behind the scenes. And we know when you make these decisions and you do these things, here's why it works. And it has to do with how you're made up, um, your sexuality, your psychology, your emotions. I mean, it all starts to come together and go, oh, oh, that's why God said. Now, listen, when we first started, it was like God said, okay, it works. I just don't know why. But once you begin to know why, that changes the whole ball game. Let me, let me prove it to you. Has anybody ever told you to do something and you said what? Why? Everybody say it. Why? And what did they tell you? <laughs> do you know why they told you that? Because they don't know. <laughs> they have no idea why they told you to do that. Or they didn't want to be honest with you. Take out the garbage. Why? I don't know. Because I said so. Why did they just say, because I don't want to? Let me free you up, parents. Next time you tell your kid to do something, go cut the grass. They go, why? Go tell them, because that's why I had you. I don't want to cut it no more. <laughs> just, just be straight with them. They'll appreciate the honesty. I'm not saying they'll like it, but they'll appreciate the honesty. We got a lot of land right now. And you know why I let the boys cut all that pasture? Because I don't want to. And they 100% know I'm not blowing smoke up their rear end. Why you want me to cut that? Because I don't want to do it. It's hot. I'm almost 50. I don't want to sit on a tractor for six hours. But y'all can. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, like, learn to, like, get into the knowledge and study the scripture, but not just about how, but also understand why it works. And when we move astray and we're seeking knowledge for knowledge's sake, people will do crazy things. Carved pieces of wood will become the gods that they worship. Sticks will hope they can wave those sticks and create a spell over something that it will, it will cure the disease or do the thing right or cause everything to move in the right direction. They will look to the stars and they will open up horoscopes and they'll look at signs and they'll look for all these things and they'll place all their faith and all their trust into all those things. And for some reason, they have a hard time embracing the reality that there is a God in the universe who made everything in it, who loves you, is merciful and graceful and wants to set you free from the thing that haunts you and that's the brokenness on the inside of you 
He has no desire for you to trust cards and stars and little pieces of incense that burn and make weird smoke. He, he wants you to worship the living God, not a dead God, a living God who can actually begin to transform you from the inside out. So the Bible kind of hammers down in several places this reality about not just knowledge for knowledge's sake, but the quality of the knowledge. It's, it's the seeking of the truth. Everybody say Jesus. John 17, 7 says, sanctify them in the truth. Listen to this. Your word is truth. So you ever wondered, what is it I need? You need the word of God. Um, Psalms 145, 18. The Lord is near to all who call on him. Listen to this. To all who call on him in truth. What does that mean? It means if you're trying to call on the Lord to manipulate to get something done for you and not for him, he's not that near in that game. But he's very near when you're calling on him for his namesake. 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, but rightly handling the word of truth. Last two come out of John, John 8.32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We always quote the end of that verse, and, and I've tried to do the best that I can to bring us back to the front side. If you like, some verses say this, if you remain in my truth then you're really my follower. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What does that mean? It means you've got to remain in reading the Word every single day, all the time, meditate on it, like hide this Word in your heart so you might sin against God. What does that mean? Miss the mark, get yourself in trouble, cause problems in your life, because a lot of people have problems going on in their life that's absolutely not God's fault. It's ours. Every now and then, it's somebody else's because they did something to you that you didn't ask for, but then it's our responsibility to align ourselves with God and know that he works all things together for the good of those who love him are called according to his purpose. Even if you mess up and it causes me pain, I will forgive you and stay aligned with God so that my life is blessed. Because as long as I don't forgive you, then bitterness sets in, and now I start to ruin my life. You're not. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No matter how far you've strayed from God, no matter how far you've gone, no matter the number of sins you've committed, um, and maybe not even the quantity of sins, but the quality of sins you've committed. Like you got some, some big ones. Here's what I would tell you. God's not so much concerned about your sin as he is your salvation. What does that mean? We get too focused and we feel disqualified and we feel like we can't come to him because of what I've done or what I'm doing or what I think I might do. And the truth is God's not concerned about that at all. Why? Because he already paid for it. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Why is that? Because he came in truth. He came to show us the way. He came to die that we may have life. And all the Bible says that he requires is that you would trust him, that you'd place your faith in him, that you would make a declaration that, you know what, I don't know everything, but what I do know is I'm busted up. And I'm going to place my trust in a God that in ways I can't see, but I know is here. How many know he's here? And when you do that, man, there's this like supernatural thing that happens. And then he says, once you do that, I want you to be baptized. And so there's like three people here today that are really want me to be quiet because they've been waiting several months to be baptized today. So if that's you, you would you guys go ahead and walk out and get ready, do what you guys got to do, Baz baptism team, get them lined up. But for everybody else in here, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. And here's what I realize. You can be in church for 20 years seeking knowledge to fix your life and never have experienced the Savior. And that's unfortunate. And here's the truth. You're probably living a good life. It's probably better than it was last year because you're gaining some knowledge and you're working really hard. And in some ways you may feel okay because here's what you're buying into that you don't realize. 
As long as my good outweighs my bad, it's going to be fine. God would never send me to hell. That's the only statement I would agree with. God would never send you to hell. As a matter of fact, God, the Bible says God doesn't wish anybody should perish, but that all come to the salvation of Jesus. All, everybody. Does that mean everybody will? No, it doesn't. But it means you can. It means you can, you can come to know and understand that Jesus is the way. That putting your faith in him is the real deal. And that he will transform you. He, you. He'll cause you to be born again. All the old stuff you brought in here, that's all gone. He washes it away. He forgives you and he restores you. He redeems you. He gives you a new mind, a new heart. Puts his spirit on the inside of you. And you know what it cost you? Nothing. It's the best deal in the universe. It's free. And I wonder if there's anybody in here who needs that gift today. Anybody logged in that needs that gift today? Would you bow your heads all over the auditorium? I want to ask you to do a bold favor for me. And I do this from time to time because I really do believe in Holy Spirit. And I believe he speaks to all people, honestly, all the time. Whether you're lost or you're saved, I think he speaks to people all the time. Regardless of how long you've been in church, regardless of how many times you've been baptized, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to ask God this. Say, God, am I your forgiven child? So I'm going to count to three, and I just want you to pray that in a whisper. And then I want you to listen. So one, two, three. Say, God, am I your forgiven child? Now, I believe one of two things happened. You had this overwhelming sense of peace that washed over you, and you heard a yes, or you heard you are my son or my daughter in whom I'm well pleased. You got some confirmation that you are absolutely born again, saved and sealed until the day of redemption. Or you had an overwhelming sense of peace where God says, but I would like you to be. I'm drawing you today. I died specifically for you. So if you're in here and you prayed that prayer and you felt impressed that today is the day of your salvation, that God is calling you, that you're not his forgiven child and you know he wants you to accept that gift today, would you raise your hand wherever you're at in this auditorium? I'm not going to come to you. I'm not asking you to come down front. One, two, three, raise your hand up really, really high until I see it. One, anybody else? Nobody looking around. Anybody else? All right, if God paused this whole service for that one, you need to know that every angel in heaven is rejoicing for that one, that heaven's throwing a party for that one. I do want to invite that one, or if there's some that didn't raise their hand that made that decision, that today would be your... Um, your day to declare what happened inside of you through baptism. That our team would love to help you. They'll give you shorts, t-shirts, all of those things. It's called spontaneous baptism. And it is, it is fun. And it's really, it's dope to walk away from church wet when you came dry. It's great to walk away, church, walk away from church forgiven when you came unforgiven. To walk away found when you came lost. To walk away seeing when you came blind. So, Father, we thank you for today. God, we thank you for moving in this service and just declaring to us the truth of your word. I pray courage over people who need to be baptized today. I thank you for the ones who already signed up, and we're going to celebrate them today and pray over them and leave today saying it was good to be in the house of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.